My father was born and raised at Tillman. Uh, his grandfather was William Sidney Covington, who built Island Bird, Island Blossom, Island Bill, Island Beauty, Island Bride, and a great number of other canoes to boot. Um, Dad was always very close to his grandfather, and um, an opportunity presented itself in 1948 uh, <clears throat> for him to acquire Bird. Uh, Bird had been owned for many years by uh, a gentleman in, in St. Michael's, um, and uh, on, on his death, his widow sold the boat to a gentleman in Annapolis whose name was Fred Touchton. Uh, he brought it to the Miles River Regatta in 1948 <clears throat> and capsized in a storm with uh, a lady or two on board. Uh, the situation was very awkward, apparently, and after offloading the crew into a rescuing powder bo power boat, a uh, bird was left overnight floating uh, somewhere out in the Miles River. Unusual situation. Recovered the next day without any difficulty, but <clears throat> it, it served to uh, convinced Mr. Touchton that perhaps um, uh, he should be content with, with mystery with a sloop rig and should divest himself of Bird. Um, and so my father was contacted and uh, agreed uh, uh, almost immediately to buy the boat because he's always admired Bird because she was so relatively small. She's the smallest of all the racing canoes. There is an exception to that in the little boat that the museum built recently called Bufflehead. But aside from, from that, Bird is rated the smallest of all the current racing boats and the oldest. She was built in 1882. Um, in any event, we acquired Bird and uh, that started my very deep involvement with canoes. And I assisted my great uncle, George North, in bringing Bird back to racing condition. Later, two or three li years later, uh, we learned that, that Bird's uh, larger sister, Island Blossom, was available. She was owned by a gentleman named Stanley Evans from the Elkton area. She was on the Sassfuss River and had been out of commission for some time. Um, and uh, we examined her, found her to be in very good condition, and my father acquired her, so we had two low canoes. Of friends and relatives, we were able to campaign both boats. Uh, ben Harrison, who was the son of John B. Harrison, uh, who was the builder of J.D., Flying Cloud, Albatross, many other ben, uh, boats of note. Uh, ben skippered Blossom for us, and in her first season after we acquired her and re-equipped her with spars and sails, uh, won virtually every race we touched. Ben was a very talented skipper, and uh, Blossom was a very fast boat. Over the years, Blossom has been uh, generally the most successful low canoe ever built. Uh, she was built, as I said, in 92 uh, to the order of Captain Will Myers of Oxford. Uh, uh, Captain Myers had extensive farmlands and he cut down pine trees which were floated to Tillman, which my great-grandfather converted into Island Blossom. And she was a winner from the outset, and uh, we were very happy to acquire her. Now let's I, my father and I greatly admired the two super canoes that John B. Harrison built. Now, John B. Harrison uh, was of a somewhat later generation uh, in that um, his 
uh, his two wives were the daughters of Sidney Covington. So we have an interrelationship between the two premier canoe owners, canoe builders rather, uh, of Tillman's Island. Uh, in 1931, um, John B. Harrison was commissioned to build a new canoe by a gentleman who lived in Easton uh, by the name of John D. Williams. Mr. Williams, um, owned two businesses. He was, he sold furniture and he also was a mortician and he carried on both those businesses from the building which is now the Arts Academy in Easton. In any event, he decided that he wanted to get into low canoe racing. Low canoe racing went through different phases uh, over the years, um, and uh, after the internal combustion engine reared its ugly head around the turn of the century, uh, boating uh, interest tended to uh, become centered upon the newfangled power boats. And so low canoe racing and sailboat racing generally dwindled in popularity. Uh, down, down from the turn of the century to uh, the 20s. But in 1927, a group of men at the Miles River Yacht Club decided to make an effort to revive long canoe racing and approached then Governor Ritchie about lending his name to a new big trophy to be known as the Governor's Cup. And Governor Ritchie obliged he did not finance it, he did not contribute to it, but he lent his name to it. And so by public subscription and subscription of Miles River Yacht Club members particularly, funds were raised to acquire the Governor's Cup, which was a great big three gallon silver trophy. Um, and this attracted a great deal of attention, as you might imagine. Yeah. Uh, and as a result of that stimulus, um, uh, the uh, sailing world uh, took a, a fresh note of log canoe racing and uh, John D. Williams of Easton decided to get into it. And so he commissioned uh, John B. Harrison, my great uncle, uh, to build him a log canoe. And uh, this, this um, new log canoe contributed to the public imagination to such a degree that there was widespread attention paid to it. And as a result, Mr. Williams ran a contest to name his new log canoe. The prize was $10 in gold uh, the advertisement was uh, conducted, the, the uh, competition was conducted through the Star Democrat. And a young man uh, came up with a brilliant idea of naming the boat J.D. And John D. Williams thought that was just right. And so the young man won the $10 in gold. He uh, turned out to be... Um, as much yacht as it was a log canoe. Uh, John B. Harrison was a great innovator and a great artist in his own right. And so J.D. was built to extraordinary specifications uh, with Honduras mahogany decks, uh, spars imported uh, from the west coast, uh, Douglas fir spars, um, the best of Egyptian cotton sails, and a very controversial feature, a transom stern. She did not come to a sharp end as canoes are supposed to, by definition, but instead of a sharp stern, she had a very pretty wine glass transom. Um, the problem was that the rules for the Governor's Cup 
provided that uh, the uh, boats competing had to be constructed along traditional lines and had to be sharp at both ends. The argument was advanced that uh, JD was sharp on the water line as a result of the wine glass configuration and hence was sharp where it had to be. That argument did not prevail, as you might imagine. Uh, so JD was declared ineligible to race for the Governor's Cup. But she was a glorious thing of beauty and raced against cruising boats and big keel boats in the bay and won everything. She was, she was um, a, a born winner, won I think 34 out of 35 races her first season. And her crew was equipped with sailor suits, top to bottom. So she was an extraordinary sight on the water, equipped with um, all sorts of spare sails, known as light sails, kites, squaresels, staysels, all sorts of things. She was immensely successful. And the next year, uh, her sister was built. Her sister was Flying Cloud. She was built to the order of Mr. Johnson Grimes, who was the retired president of New York Shipbuilding. Uh, the name Johnson Grimes is familiar to many in Talbot County because Johnson Grimes Jr. built the Tidewater Inn. Uh, Flying Cloud was built to the same model, the same half model, uh, which we're fortunate to own, um, as was JD. Um, complete with transom stern. Uh, so the two boats were very evenly matched uh, and a great deal of controversy arose as to which was the better boat uh, and the skipper of JD was persuaded to leave JD and go to Flying Cloud uh, and there was talk of money changing hands and uh, Cloud was uh, equipped with fancy sailor suits too, uh, and all the best of everything. Um, John Williams did not want to alter J.D. to compete for the Governor's Cup, so he commissioned a third boat, Mystery, which was built at Oxford by Price Sinclair. Mystery was uh, conventional in shape, that is, she had a true sharp stern, and was designed by Captain Clarence Dobson, or so he claimed, telling me that he modeled mystery uh, after Island Blossom, because he had sailed on Blossom when she was first built in 92 but without Blossom's hollow undersections. She was beamier and fuller. Um, so Mystery was able to, to race for the Governor's Cup, but um, Mr. Johnson Grimes could not race for the Governor's Cup, but he wanted to do so. Consequently, he took the boat back to John B. Harrison and and told him to make her sharp stern. Um, and with a tear in the eye, or several tears in his eyes, um, the boat was modified to a, a sort of a rounded sharp stern, at least sharp enough to qualify. And consequently, in 1934, she won the Governor's Cup, which was, which was uh, Mr. Grimes' uh, objective. Um, we, my father and I, of course, admired all canoes, but those two boats were especially interesting. Uh, Flying Cloud had been purchased by an artist in New York, an artist by the name of John Noble, who uh, carried Cloud to his home on Staten Island, where she sat alongside his floating uh, art studio for many, many years. J.D., on the other hand, remained in local waters and was something of a mystery uh, in that uh, she was in the possession of 
uh, Captain Jim Richardson of Cambridge, who had a small boat yard outside Cambridge. And he looked after the boat, kept her in proper order, and had the right, through an understanding with the owner, to use the boat as he saw fit. And so it was a, a pleasure for him and his family to have the use of JD, which he sailed with her racing mainmast set forward in the four, the four uh, slot. Uh, so she was manageable with a reduced sail as a day sailor. Uh, to me, um, JD was, was um, uh, simply an exquisite, exquisite vessel. Um, and I was interested in the possibility of acquiring the boat. Uh, but the powers that be, that is those that who had her in possession, uh, Captain, Captain Jim Richardson, who was a fine, fine gentleman, and uh, one or two other people in Cambridge, uh, we were not anxious for it to be known who really owned the boat. Um, uh, I, I uh, tried to look into that and tried to under, unearth who the owner was. Could not do so. One day I was reading The New Yorker and came upon a profile of a gentleman, uh, a resident of New York, by the name of Robert Dowling. Mr. Dowling was a man of considerable substance, owned the Hotel Carlisle, uh, was the first man to swim around Manhattan Island, so he said, and had a great collection of boats of all sizes, shapes, and descriptions, including a <laughs> strange and peculiar creature called a Chesapeake Bay log canoe. I wrote to Mr. Dowling. We established a uh, good rapport because not only was he a canoe owner, but uh, he was also an old car collector, as was I. And so we had that in common. It seems that um, in, uh, shortly after the war, uh, Mr. Williams decided to divest himself of the boat and consequently advertised her, of all places, in the Wall Street Journal, where she was seen uh, by Mr. Dowling. And Dowling contacted uh, Mr. Williams and said, I'm very interested in your, in your boat. Could, could you arrange a trial sail if I came down? And Mr. Williams did and got a crew together and Mr. Dowling flew down in his seaplane, of course, and landed off Oxford and went for a 20-minute ride and said, I'll take her. <laughs> and that was that. He got back in his seaplane and was never seen again. He never came back. So the boat uh, sat as a day sailor, in effect, for years and years. Uh, and then I got a a letter one day from the Bank of New York saying that Mr. Dowling had uh, become incompetent. They were liquidating his estate. I had some correspondence indicating that I was once interested in the boat, and was I still interested? And I was, and I bought the boat. <laughs> it, was, it was a very fortuitous uh, chain of events. So we, we, we acquired JD and re-rigged her uh, properly, and she's been a member of the family ever since. She's owned by my son, Dan, Daniel, um, and has been very successfully sailed by him and a number of other people. She has a tremendous handicap because of her size, and frequently, very frequently, finishes first, but because of the handicap, uh, is denied the corrected time uh, victory. Um, Dan uh, is a great competitor, and he enjoyed finishing first, but he really wanted to win some races. So a couple of years ago, uh, two years ago, 
uh, he was presented with an opportunity with a friend to buy another log canoe, Persistence, which was owned by the Johnson brothers in Chestertown. Uh, Persistence had been a very, very successful boat uh, 15 years ago. She uh, was uh, every bit as dominant then as Blossom is today. And Dan seized upon this as an opportunity not only to finish first, but to win races, or perhaps more accurately, win, race, win races without finishing first. So um, we now have um, a, a flotilla, shall we say, of four log canoes which we somehow or other managed to campaign, which takes a lot of effort, a lot, say, of, a lot of doing, uh, and uh, a lot of pleasure, and a lot of, a lot of exercise for all concerned.